Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Nancy Goodman, Vice President for Policy at the Environmental League of Massachusetts. ELM is a 121 year old environmental advocacy organization based on Beacon Hill. Well, like many of you, though, I'm sure I'm working from home now. We've been advocating for Massachusetts to lead the nation in responsible environmental policy since 1898. We've long been a convener on environmental issues and we're proud to continue this long tradition in a new digital way. I'm thrilled to welcome our over 250 viewers joining us from across the Commonwealth on Zoom. And we're also streaming this on Facebook Live. This is the seventh edition of a 10 part webinar, webinar series that ELM has been putting on and it'll run through June 10th. So I hope you'll be able to join us for the last three sessions as well. Together, we've explored the intersection of public policy and the two crises of COVID-19 and climate change. During the past weeks, we've learned about the interconnections between climate change and human health how the most vulnerable among us are bearing the brunt of these impacts, how federal policymakers are approaching a stimulus package, how the coverage of climate change in the media shapes the imperative for action, how youth climate activists are adapting to this new normal, and how our state officials are challenging federal efforts to roll back longstanding environmental protections. Next week, we'll discuss perspectives on environmental policy at the federal, state, and local levels with U.S. Congressman Jim McGovern, State Rep. Tom Golden, and Quincy City Councilor Nina Liang. But today, we're going to explore the future of transportation post-COVID-19 with Monica Tibbetts-Nutt. So for the next hour, you can expect about 15 minutes of remarks from Monica and then we'll do 20 minutes of discussion with questions from the ELM team and questions that registrants submitted in advance. And then the last part of the webinar will be questions from the viewers. You can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit a question at any time during the webinar. And you can also vote up a question that you like. The ELM team will be um, gathering the questions and giving them to me um, and Monica and I will answer them for the last uh, portion of the webinar. As I mentioned, the event is being broadcast on Facebook Live and we're also recording these sessions. They'll be available on ELM's YouTube page so you can share the link with folks that couldn't make it today that might be interested. So we are so privileged to have Monica Tibbetts Nutt with us today. I also serve as the chair of the Transportation for Massachusetts Coalition, and so I've had interactions with Monica, and she's a great partner and advocate. She's the executive director of the 128 Big Business Council, which advocates for green communities and better transportation options. She also serves on the board of the Mass Department of Transportation, and she's the vice chair of the Fiscal Management and Control Board that currently oversees the MBTA. The FMCB has been meeting almost every week since its inception in 2015. So I just wanted to give Monica a huge personal thanks for her service during that time. Her areas of specialty are transportation planning, urban design, and transit equity. In both her work and research, Monica is interested in better, educate, better educating transportation stakeholders and the public about all aspects of the planning process. So again, thank you so much, Monica, for joining us. I'm gonna turn it over to you for your remarks. Thank you so much, Nancy. I really appreciate you know, being able to spend some time with everyone during this very, very difficult time to really go through some of the things that we're facing as policymakers around transportation and some of the things that my company is facing as a transit provider. So first, obviously this is an incredibly difficult time and we are dealing with unprecedented not only issues, but unprecedented challenges in delivering the transportation that our communities need. First thing that we're obviously facing is the financial implications. You're looking at a bunch of systems nationwide, internationally, that are not only being hit by increased costs around being able to provide clean, safe transportation, but we're also looking at a huge, huge decrease in revenue. 
whether that's looking at our fares, which we are not able to collect, looking at the sales tax revenue that has been going to the MBTA traditionally to help with the budget, to even looking at the federal and state assistance. Currently, we are taking federal funds and we have been using state assistance from Massachusetts, but we have seen a significant decrease in our fair revenue, significant decrease in our sales tax revenue. And so for us, it's really looking at the funds that we're getting from the state and federal government and how best they can be used at this time. Really looking at, as I said, making sure that we have enough funds for the new cleaning protocols and making sure that we have enough funds to provide the type of service we're going to need as the economy and the phasing continues into the fall. So as I mentioned, big impact financially is really looking at the fares. And so as we're looking at that, I think a question that many of us are asking ourselves is, are riders going to feel comfortable coming back to public transit? What is that phasing gonna look like? And when can we start to expect ridership to get back to the numbers we were seeing before? Our numbers on commuter rail and our numbers on the subway are obviously very, very low at this point. Bus ridership has held much higher than our, tra our train system. But as you're looking at this, one of the things we need to be thinking about from a cleanliness and physical distancing standpoint are how many people we can actually fit on our system. As I said, the buses have continued to carry the highest ridership through this, and that's really looking at essential workers and workers who need to be going into work for many different reasons, whether economically or whether from trying to keep their jobs during this time period. I think we're gonna to continue to see that increase on the bus system as we're moving through the phasing. And so one of the biggest issues we need to be thinking about in that is, as I said, making sure that we can do the physical distancing, making sure that we have enough capacity as we are carrying less passengers, and really thinking about the equity issues a lot of those communities are facing. This is something we've talked about significantly on the Fiscal Management Control Board, is really looking at equitable service and making sure that we're serving all of our communities equally. And I think when it comes to the bus service, that has been probably the biggest focus of ours because A, it's the most flexible service, but it does tend to carry the majority of vulnerable riders and vulnerable communities. And we've had significant issues with on-time performance leading up to this. And now with having to do a significant amount of physical distancing, we're going to continue to see that. So as we're moving forward, I think what we hear a lot from our communities, our constituents is, what is this gonna look like going forward? What is my service gonna look like? As I said, we're going to continue with the cleaning protocols, which are extraordinary and really been put in place to make sure that we're protecting our riders at multiple points, whether it's at a bus stop, a station, or on the vehicles themselves. So in addition to that, we need to make sure that we're actually protecting our operators too, which means a significant amount of money around PPE and making sure that their spaces are clean as well. And then as I said, we do not have a clear idea of when we're going to be able to start collecting fares. And I think we're in a very similar situation as many of the national properties are trying to figure that out. And so as we're going into the phasing, it's gonna be very important for us to monitor the ridership, monitor the nodes that are being used for particular routes and really get an understanding of, are we having crowding situations? What additional resources, whether fleet or operators, do we need to be putting on for these services? And really tracking as the ridership increases. What we've been looking at through the budget is looking at, as we're going into the fall, increases of about 10% per month. That's obviously a very moving target, but that's what we're looking at right now. And the board will be convening tomorrow to approve the budget. And that's kind of what we're going with as far as a prediction as best we can. So then, I mean, I think the biggest thing going forward is really working on the public's perception. As many have seen, many polls, the globe, many of the national transit bodies, it's very clear that people do not feel safe coming back onto public transit at this point. So I think that is going to take a significant amount of communication, a significant amount of education to not only let the riders know what we're doing from a cleaning standpoint, what we're doing from an operational standpoint to make sure that they are safe as possible, but also being very clear what we need from them, what different step riders are gonna have to take to help ensure that the system is as safe as possible. And then, as I mentioned, really thinking about the resource allocation since we are carrying significantly less capacity than we normally would. As you're looking around the country for you know, your standard 40-foot bus, 
we've seen agencies around doing the 12 to 16 passengers per bus which is significantly lower than the obvious carrying capacity of the buses and what we've traditionally carried. And that's going to be really important to monitor and really important to make sure that we're doing those spot checks. Now, from a private operations standpoint, the Business Council's been providing transit services for the last 33 years. We are privately financed and publicly available. So we're a little bit different model than your typical transit system. And for us, what we've really been focusing on is updating our cleaning protocols, operating protocols, redesigning the way our buses are actually configured to allow for greater protection for the operators and greater protection for the riders. But all of this comes at a significant cost. And the conversations we've been having with our companies, with our developers have really centered around what do you think that phasing looks like? What do you see as far as bringing your employees back? What types of employees are you bringing back and when? And I think also having very real conversations about teleworking. Traditionally, Massachusetts has had single digit percentages when it came to working from home. And now the majority of us are working from home. And that is not only reducing transportation congestion, but obviously reducing the greenhouse gases. So what lessons are we gonna take for that as we're moving into this opening, but also as we're going into the future. Now that companies know that there are ways to make teleworking actually happen and employees can be productive, how do we take that and start building more flexible work schedules, more teleworking options as the state starts to reopen and going into the future? Because what we need to be looking at is not just the next six months and how we're phasing people out, and I mean out into the community, it really is looking at what does the next 12, 24, and 36 months look like for our communities and for our transportation systems. And that's everything from cleanliness, safety, to the finances and the sustainability of our systems. The one thing I feel like we can all agree on is our lives, our society are going to be forever changed by this. And so it's gonna be very important for us to think about the stop gaps, but then really think about what are the protocols, what are the plans that need to be in place for this transition into what our new society is going to look like. And I think transportation being the backbone of a lot of our communities, it's gonna be really important that we approach that the same way. As many of you know, we had significant financial issues coming into this. And by we, I mean transportation as an industry throughout the United States. And so that issue can, already existed and now I think the pandemic is obviously exacerbating that situation. So I think it's going to take a lot from public officials to legislators, elected officials to really think about what does the future of transportation funding need to look like and not just to get through this time period but to be able to expand a lot of these systems and to continue to bring people out of the single occupancy vehicles. We cannot lose sight of what our goals were before because of the situation we're dealing with. The goals need to be the same. I just think the delivery method and the path to get there is going to be significantly different than it has been traditionally. So really in closing, we're all working tirelessly to figure out what this new transportation system, what this new normal looks like. And as the governor has released the plan, his plan for phasing back in, I think it's just a lot of it is gonna remain to be seen because we know when people are going to be allowed to start coming back. We have a clear idea of when different businesses are gonna be allowed to come back. But I think the biggest question is gonna be, when do those businesses, when do those sectors feel comfortable coming back? When do they feel comfortable bringing their employees back? When are people going to feel comfortable using public transit again? And like I said, it's gonna be a significant amount of communication, a significant amount of work on all of our different sectors parts to make it very clear to our customers, to our clients, that you can feel comfortable, that you can feel safe, and you can feel that you know that the different plans that we're putting in place are going to be sufficient, and they're going to be able to provide the level of transportation needed to help the economy come back. Because that's the other thing, we talk about all of these things, but also many of us know our economy is facing an unprecedented situation that we have not seen since the Great Depression. So how do we bring those employees back on and how do we make sure that they can get to where they need to go? Because beyond just having those who have 
other options feel comfortable to come on the system, we have to make sure that we are not leaving those communities, not leaving those individuals who have no other option out of this plan because it is not good enough to just provide the minimal amount of service. We have to provide the optimal amount of service so that those people can go to school when they open again, get back to their jobs and find new jobs since so many people are out of work at this point. So it seems like a significant amount of balls to be juggling at the same time, but unfortunately we don't have another choice. This is the type of coordination and planning that are going to be needed to bring us back to economically where we were before, but also make sure that we are ready and prepared to build the new society, to build the new physical spaces, to build the new psychological well-being of our community so that we can come back from this and come back even better. Thank you. I can't think of a more timely or relevant subject. Um, as you mentioned, uh, businesses and institutions are starting to reopen. I know everyone at ELM takes public transportation to work. So this has been you know, front and center for the staff and thinking about when do we get back to work and for many of my colleagues as well. So all of the issues that you raised around, you know, feeling safe, feeling comfortable, when, when to reopen, um, you know, what protocols are in place that will make people feel like they can start taking the tea or whatever their form of transportation is again, um, is really top of mind for everybody as we are starting this next phase. Um, so now I just wanted to transition to some of the questions that we um, at ELM put together along with those that were submitted in advance. Um, and as I, I wanna remind viewers that you can still submit questions using the Q&A button below. Um, you did talk about, of course, the financial uh, ramifications of this, you know, huge decrease in use. Um, I just wanted to probe a little bit deeper with you about the uh, financial implications, given the reductions in fare collections and obviously the state's fiscal condition. Um, what adjustments do you see happening? What's being considered? And also, how is this impacting um, planned long-term investments? So many of us have lots of projects that we would like to see in terms of expansion. Um, and so just what is the board thinking um, given our new reality here? So a lot of this is really being discussed as we as a board are discussing the budget. As I said, we will be moving forward to approve it tomorrow. And to speak about the long-term plans, as we were going through a budget, it was really, really important that we maintained the funding for multiple different projects, whether that was for the commuter rail transformation, really looking at moving to more of a regional rail, to the bus transformation, really reimagining the way our buses and our services operate through the communities. And those funds have been preserved. I think the other thing that people don't realize is along with the reduced service right now, it actually gives us an opportunity to move forward with a lot of our capital improvement projects. And those projects have been moving forward and those schedules will actually be sped up because we are not carrying as many passengers. So that has continued to be preserved. I think the, the big question mark is really gonna be what do these service models look like as people are coming back? And that is really quite a question mark. As I said, within the budget, there are some presumptions we have made as far as the percentage of riders that are going to be coming back at what time. And it really is kind of focused on that August, September, looking at about 10% each month. That is a very, very educated guess using the best information we have, the best information any transit agency has. So I think the biggest question there is not only what are the impacts of that revenue loss, but what additional investments are going to have to be made because of the way we're going to have to deliver that service. That's really going to be a big question mark for us. I think we have a clear idea of what the cleaning protocols have taken, but that physical distancing and the changing capacity, that is a giant, giant financial question mark. I would say in regards to the rest of the budget, as I said, the goals have not changed. The projects that are so fundamental to the transition that the T is going through have not changed. Those have all been preserved through the budget. And like I said, that's everything from our capital projects to even looking at the fare transformation project. All of that has been preserved. The budget, as you know, and as many people know, we're going to have to keep forecasting this as we're going forward. But we do feel really confident that we're not going to lose speed on these really, really big projects. And I think in a lot of ways, as I said, our capital projects are going to be able to move quicker. 
And I think as we're starting to look at the bus service and having these conversations with communities, looking at more of the dedicated lanes, looking at taking much more of the right of way for either cyclists, pedestrians, buses, which is also going to allow us to move through the corridor as much quicker, which is going to have a direct kind of coordination with the capacity issues that we might be facing, especially on the bus system. So overall, the large scale projects are being maintained. We are going to continue forward with a lot of those and we are not going to let the situation currently impact that in any way. Because as I said, we need to be planning for 12, 24, 36 months and that progression is going to be incredibly important, I think, especially as traffic congestion comes back. And I think looking at you know, the goals we've had, especially around greenhouse gases and how dirty transportation is, you know, look, continuing to look at the electrification, all of those things are going to have to continue to be studying and they're going to have to continue to be moving at the pace that they were before. Well, I'm happy to hear you say that. Um, I wanted to just touch briefly on uh, federal infrastructure uh, dollars, um, stimulus spending. I know that um, in the CARES Act, there was um, 25 billion for transit systems across the country. I think we're getting about a billion of that. Um, so could you just talk a little bit about what that means and you know what kind of gaps that um, amount can fill? Yeah, I mean, it's really going through helping us really quite with the, the revenue loss that we've been facing for the reasons I identified. But it is also really looking at the infrastructure. This is something we've been talking about for quite some time, which really led to the commuter rail transformation team that our chair, Joe Aiello, had pushed forward for. We need to start giving people better options and we need to start putting in the same effort into our rail nationally as we have traditionally our highway systems. And I think for us, it really is focusing on the rail. Our highways obviously carry so many people that it is important that we're maintaining them, et cetera. But that shift to really that regional rail and that shift of giving people options outside of that inner core is gonna to continue to be really important. And with the federal funding, we have an opportunity to invest more in that. I think you've seen some states that are really gonna pour it a lot into highway. I think here in Massachusetts, looking at the traffic congestion, we're in kind of a different situation. So I think for us as a state, that focus is really gonna to need to be on transit, other options, and making sure obviously our highways are safe, our bridges are safe and keeping up with the infrastructure, but really thinking about how we build additional infrastructure really focused on getting away from the single occupancy vehicle. And I think having these federal dollars is going to give us the opportunity to do that. And also hoping that this CARES Act is going to lead into a much more thoughtful consideration when we think about the next transportation reauthorization. Because I think that is an opportunity for the federal government to really kind of move away from that highway centric focus and really start to target those investments into alternative transportation options. Because I think, as I said, traditionally, it's been poured in the highway and we've seen what the result of that has been. It hasn't been an easing of traffic congestion. It hasn't been an easing of our greenhouse gases. It has worked very actively against both of those. And so I do, I think this is a chance for the federal government to make much wiser, much more long-term decisions. Well, uh, that's music to my ears. I hope that is in fact the case as we go forward with uh, reauthorization of transportation uh, funding at the federal level. Um, as a city planner, how do you think residential and commercial density may be impacted by this crisis? Um, is transit-oriented development going to suffer? It's something that I've worked on quite a bit doing the smart growth work that ELM's engaged in. And I know that there's been you know, concerns about people now being afraid also of, of dense urban settings um, to live and work. Yeah, I mean, transit-oriented development has been a focus of my career as long as I've been a planner. And I think in Massachusetts, it has been a huge opportunity that has not been taken advantage of to the level that it needed to be. Our communities, for the most part in Massachusetts, are not particularly dense. They just aren't. The inner core, there are denser neighborhoods, but I would say as far as entire municipalities, there's a significant amount of density that could still be captured. And the way I would actually think about it is, as we're seeing employment changes, as we're seeing changes in how our economy works, this is actually an opportunity to really think about getting people closer to where they work. 
because not only is that going to help with congestion, greenhouse gases, but it's also going to give people a better opportunity to seek different employment and different education if they're not spending such a high percentage of their income on transportation. And we had a housing crisis before, we still have a housing crisis. We cannot let this be another reason not to continue to build more housing, and especially around our transit nodes, our transit stations. It is such a huge opportunity to also deal with the inequity of the places where transit is provided. But I think if we are not continuing on focusing on the TOD, not continuing on focusing on building more dense communities, it is actually going to put us in a worse situation because it is going to force people to travel further. It is going to force people to travel in ways that, from a financial standpoint, are not sustainable for many households. And it's going to continue to create so much traffic congestion. And that's huge, huge, huge. And so I think my concern is I feel like a lot of people come up with a lot of reasons and excuses for not building housing. This cannot be one of them. And so I think the conversation is really going to have to be reframed around you need people to have more employment and education opportunities, especially where our economy is right now. And looking at the employer sector. Before this, many of my clients, whether it was a company developer, were struggling, struggling to get employees, especially with how low our unemployment percentage was before. And the main reason for that is people cannot get to these offices, cannot get to these jobs. And this is going to continue if we make no changes going forward. So I think also for our economy to come back and for those companies to be able to restaff, they need to be able to get employees that can get to their jobs. And I think with the, with the situation from a finance standpoint that many households are facing right now, that focus cannot be on getting a single occupancy vehicle. It can't be on finding different ways that are probably be more expensive to get to work. So it actually works in everyone's favor to continue building more housing and continuing to build it around those transit centers. I don't think, and I don't think nationally anyone has put this forward, that the transit-oriented development or the way those houses are built, those communities are built, and the density that they're looking at has had any indication or any has played any role in the spread of the coronavirus within the United States. And that's what I'm gonna talk about specifically, the United States. That could change as we're starting to get more data and more information. But at this point, I still think we need to be focusing on giving people more housing options and more employment options, especially as the economy is starting to rebound. Great, thanks so much. Um, I wanna, um, you've touched on equity in some of your comments, um, but I uh, have a question here. Uh, so maybe we can um, talk about it a little bit more. Uh, the pandemic has shown more starkly than ever the inequities that exist in our society, the impacts of income inequality, lack of access to quality healthcare and poor air quality in certain communities are causing extreme harm, even death. Transportation emissions disproportionately impact communities of color and low income communities. How is the broader awareness of these issues uh, shaping transportation system planning? It was a big issue before. It's something that we have been talking about, I think, especially in the last few years as an industry. It has become even more important. We have talked about for a very long time around air quality, and I think the elected officials in Massachusetts, I'm thinking Mayor Kirby Tone, have spoken a lot about the air quality concerns and what the, what the designs as far as our highway system, how that has played into that. And now that we have a virus that attacks the respiratory system and disproportionately has impacted our communities of color, this continues to be even a bigger issue. And I would also say when it comes to those who are still having to use public transit and having to put themselves in those situations, it continues to be disproportionately the communities of color. And so when it comes to the transportation planning from a public transit standpoint, it's gonna be really monitoring the crowding on these bus routes, looking at those nodes and finding better, cleaner ways to provide transit to those communities. And then I think as you're looking at the rail system, really taking the time as we're making these capital improvements, looking at these projects, are there better ways to do this? Looking at electrification, looking at the stops we're making are there different stops different communities that need access to this 
it has to be a holistic thing and it has to be looking at it from an economic standpoint, a public health standpoint, and a transportation standpoint. Because once again, I think in a crisis situation, a lot of people can use that as an excuse not to deal with these larger issues. But in this particular crisis, if we continue to ignore those issues, you are endangering those communities even more than they were before. And then in addition to that, thinking about the other issues as far as food scarcity, that's a really, really big concern right now. Because if you look at the education system and look at the schools who are providing food to a lot of these families and a lot of these students, many of them are no longer able to do so. And as people are losing more and more of their jobs, they have less and less income to be focusing on feeding themselves, feeding their kids. And if you think about how far the housing is from a lot of these grocery stores, a lot of the Costco's, et cetera, you're then making it even harder for those people to actually access the resources that they need. So this is a huge transportation issue. And I think it is exacerbated by this pandemic. And I think for us, if we do not focus on that as part of the pandemic recovery and as part of the rebuilding of our communities, we are not only missing out, and I hate to say it as an opportunity, we're not only missing out um, an opportunity to make better planning decisions, but we're also going to create even more inequity than we had before, it, which is going to continue to punish our communities and punish our neighborhoods. And then at some point you think, as the economy recovers, will those communities recover? Or will they be lost as we're looking at the rest of this because they are the ones still having to go to work and they're the ones that do not have the time to be going on forums, going to webinars and going to these virtual public meetings because at that point, they're really just trying to keep their family afloat and be able to feed their kids. So it has to be at the center of everything we're doing, the same as it needed to be before, but it is so much more important than that. Uh, we definitely agree. Um, the uh, stark inequities that have been revealed from the pandemic, um, I think have been um, highlighted and front and center quite a bit in the media. So I'm hoping that we do take this moment to um, urge our public officials to really address these issues that have been long standing but just so much worsened by um, COVID-19, what we're seeing. Um, you had also talked about um, decrease in congestion. Um, we're seeing, of course, a lot less traffic, which uh, means, uh, you know, a reduction, at least temporarily, in the greenhouse gas and other emissions from cars. Um, that's good news for us that work on climate change issues. And we're learning that we can, work, that many of us can work from home, not everybody, of course. So I'm just wondering, what are you learning from this forced experiment? And I might combine that with a question about, like, what are you hearing from the businesses that you serve? You talked a little bit about um, their plans for reopening, but um, I'd just like to hear a little bit more about conversations you've had with business owners um, in the 128 region and what they're thinking in terms of reopening and what services they feel they need going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, obviously the traffic congestion has gotten significantly better. And I think, as I said before, teleworking works clearly because many of us are able to continue our work remotely. And I think that that and the flexible work schedules are going to have to be a giant lesson learned as we move forward. And so as we're phasing this in, also thinking about how are we phasing the traffic back in? How exactly is that gonna work? How do we take this, this snapshot in time and use this to change the way we work going forward? Looking at more flexible schedules, looking at more work from home days and keeping this and continuing to move forward. Because I think the biggest question a lot of people have had, and I think one of the bigger kind of hurdles that a lot of companies had talked about when thinking about more flexible work from home schedules, just like, what's the productivity gonna look like? How are people gonna be able to do this? How are they going to adapt to this? Well, we have adapted. And for many people, and I've seen this with my own company, the productivity has actually increased by taking out the amount of time each of us has to commute each day. So we've proven that it can work. So as the phasing goes forward, I think it's also going to be important to think about the phasing of how we're putting back commuting. 
And what I've heard from a lot of the companies is, as I said, a lot of them are going to continue to be closed for quite some time. They do not want to put their employees in a situation that may be unsafe. And they really want to see, you know, as the vaccinations, as the testing, all of these things progress, what does that look like for bringing their employees back? But it is one of these things where, as I said, the employee retention and getting new employees was such a huge issue before this. And I think it's going to be a huge issue as we move forward. So I think if they're going to have if they're going to have the best chance to actually rebuild their workforce, it's going to have to be on more of this flexible model. It's just going to have to be. And I think that is what is going to give us the best hope of reducing the traffic congestion. And then, as I also mentioned before, it's going to be really important to look at the rights of way. How are we using these rights of way? Who is actually getting this street allocation? And I think for moving more people at a physically distant space, that's going to be really important, having those dedicated lanes, having those buses move quicker. And then coming out of this as the employees are coming on, you're then giving them more options. You're giving them more options for public transit and you're giving them quicker commutes. Buses and dedicated lanes just move faster. And in areas and corridors that have the dedicated lanes, the cars move faster. So it's kind of a win-win for everybody here, but I think the big thing is it's, we're gonna have to be vigilant on this. We can't, once we reopen, go back to the way it was before. It's just not gonna work. And I don't think any company feels as solidly about not having teleworking as they did before. It really is building off of a lot of the equity concerns, but also it's a new equity concern for a lot of employers. We really do not want to be excluding people who must be more careful with their health from job opportunities, because I think that's another thing that kind of gets lost in this conversation. For those who have compromised immune systems, it is not going to be as quick for them to come back to work. And employers cannot afford to keep out of the workplace that big of a population. And so I think that's also gonna change the way that we structure how our offices look and what our work looks like. It's gonna have to be different. It needed to be different for a really long time. This is our case study that that different can work and we really have to carry it forward. Or I think quite honestly, we're gonna have a very, very difficult time rebounding economically from the pandemic. Yeah, I have a hard time imagining anybody wanting to return to an hour commute when they've um, been able to work from home. I'm sure yep. for some people that will be necessary, but it will be a, a hard uh, a hard sell, I imagine. Um, yes. So I have one more question from that had been submitted in advance, and then we'll turn to questions from viewers. Um, as you know, Monica, right before the crisis uh, began, the House had passed a transportation revenue package. And so I'm just wondering, what's your sense of what's needed now or what we might see going forward? I mean, honestly, like I said, many of the projects that were already in the budget and already programmed, they're still needed. Many of our long-term capital investments are still going to be needed. That has not changed any. I think, like I said, the big question is going to be, what do the revenues look like going forward? What revenues are we going to be able to recapture? What additional revenues are going to be needed? And I think that's going to have to be a constant conversation, which it has been with the legislature, because they're having to react in real time the same way that we are. And I feel like this has really brought us more together. And I think it's opened up even more lines of communication around this because it has become very evident not only the issues we were having before, but what those issues moving forward are actually gonna look like as we're doing this reopening. So I actually think that there is an opportunity for us to re-examine how we're doing the transportation funding, because you've already seen that with the legislature over the last several years. Their view on it has really changed and their openness for additional funding has changed. Now I think we're just gonna have to take this even more forward as it becomes clearer what the economy is going to look like. I think it's going to be very interesting as we go into the fourth quarter of this year, where we're at from a funding standpoint and where the legislature and the municipalities see as the, as the targets for additional funding, whether that's on the fleet side, whether that's additional stations, et cetera. It's going to be kind of a continuing conversation, but I do think it has come into focus what is needed and that was happening before this crisis. And I think this crisis is just making that even clearer. 
Great. So we're going to turn to questions from viewers. We, um, I'm told we got a record number of questions uh, for our webinar. So um, obviously, this is a topic that's really relevant and important to everybody. Um, so the first question is talking about rural and urban differences. And so we've talked a lot about kind of Metro Boston and transit, but maybe putting on your mouse dot hat. So looking more broadly throughout the state, how do you take into account the differences between the rural western part of the state and the urban eastern part of the state and, and their different needs? I mean, this is something I've talked about many times, you know, as we get outside of the inner core, which I think the inner core gets the majority of conversation. And maybe I think of outside the inner core because that is in my day job, the main focus. I think the rural communities have been cut off and have been traditionally ignored by many transit systems because it just seems too far or too big of a leap to make to try and provide better services. But going back to what I said about the commuter rail transformation, the commuter rail service needs to work better for those outer line communities. And for that to happen, it needs to be more regional rail. It needs to be operating at similar headways that our subway systems are. It needs to have additional stations. We need to be using the information we have about where people are living and better connecting them to where they need to be working. Then I also think in addition to the regional rail, because that is going to take a significant amount of time, looking at other services that can be provided in the meantime, looking at the buses. And I'm not talking about the buses that make 50, 60 stops, making the world's longest commute if you live outside the inner core, but looking at more express services. Working with the communities to understand where their residents need to be going, as opposed to continuing to duplicate bus service bus services and bus routes that were put together 40, 50 years ago. It's going to have to be a much more pointed conversation. And I think the communities are going to have to be brought in on a more direct conversation about what their needs are, but then also looking at what their planning initiatives are. What do they see from a housing density? What are their plans going forward so we can actually make sure that the tra transportation is lining up? because these communities have been traditionally ignored. It's just true. There's no way around it. That is what's happened. And they've been consistently cut off from the rest of the state. And once again, going back to if our economy is going to come back and it's going to come back even stronger, these communities have to be better connected. And so we're going to have to think much more thoughtfully and really quite, quite more innovatively in how we do this and what those services look like, because these communities can't wait another 15, 20 years to have better access. And I think also a lot of those communities are building more housing than the inner core is. They're actually answering the challenge that the state put forward in building more housing. So they're doing their part. Now the transportation sector needs to meet them where they are because they're doing the housing part. Now we need to provide the transportation to connect those residents to the jobs, to the educational opportunities that they need and quite honestly deserve. Great, thank you. I know um, that I've become aware that a lot of the RTA routes haven't been changed in decades, and it seems um, this is a moment to reimagine uh, bus service outside of Metro Boston for sure. Um, so I do a lot of work on something called the Transportation and Climate Initiative, which I imagine you're familiar with, and we've gotten a lot of questions about that. Um, this would be a, a regional cap and invest program that would help us reach both our transportation and our climate goals. Um, so we think it's still imp very important. Um, just wondering what you think the, likely, the likelihood is of it becoming a reality and is ha has the crisis changed um, people's perceptions or thinking about the need for the program? I mean, I don't know if it's changed people's perceptions about the need for the program as far as them suddenly thinking that it's not a priority because of everything else that we have going on. I personally think it needs to be more of a priority. I've often thought that, but I think especially now, these are the kinds of plans and programs we're going to need to recover from this. And it's just true. And I think especially to actually help to rebuild those communities that have been disproportionately impacted from a health standpoint, we're going to have to look into the electrification. We're going to have to push more for widespread adoption of the electrification. And as I said before, taking the rights of way, reducing the amount of space that single occupancy vehicles get because they're not carrying the majority and they're not keeping our communities clean. They're just not. 
So I actually think it is more important and is going to continue to be more important and needs to get greater focus as we're moving through this. Because if we do ignore this, we're not just going to be in the same situation we are now or the same situation we were 10 years ago. I think we're going to push ourselves even further back than we were before at a time where it is even more important than it was even six months ago. So no, I think it can, needs to continue. And I think when it comes to the financials and the investments we're making, it needs to be a central part of those decisions. Great, thank you so much. Um, we had a number of folks submit questions um, about the changing role of walking and biking um, post COVID. Um, I know you touched on it earlier, but one viewer wrote, how do we encourage and accommodate into the future the shift we are seeing to walking and biking as an alternative to driving and as a last mile option linking to transit? Um, so, and also what should cities and towns be thinking of uh, and doing in terms of making it, uh, creating more space for pedestrians and cyclists? We've heard you know, about some street closings. Uh, so just that whole topic about um, active transportation and alternatives. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, like if you had asked me once again, six months ago, if I thought that we would be talking so much about biking and walking, I wouldn't have believed you. Or if you had asked me whether elected officials would be talking so much about allocating more space for these two modes, I never would have believed it. To make this a more equitable option, which is really what we need to be talking about, we have to advocate for the transit-oriented development. Walking and biking need to be real options for folks who cannot, for health, mobility, or just job function reasons, walk or bike long distances. And again, advocating for the similar, seemingly denser design means doing the planning work to make the human movement through those spaces safe. It really is looking at the built form. We are an unplanned region for the most part. So, you know, as we were kind of, as people talk about paving over the cow pass, we had limited space and the way traditionally we've allocated that has really been towards the car. We've continued to have issues with the first and last mile. And so I think as we are talking about giving people more space so that they can physically distance when walking and biking, I do think, as you said, we need to create permanent corridors. They cannot go away when people are starting to come back. And you know, looking at what Somerville's doing, actually connecting these corridors to the places we know people need to get to. But it needs to be in coordination with the other investments we're making around housing. It needs to be part of an actual coordinated plan. But I do think the discussion around the reallocation of physical space is amazing. It's an amazing discussion to be had. And I think it also just continues to point out, as we're looking at the popularity of these modes and looking at the popularity of these corridors, it's giving us the information and the justification to make them more permanent as we're rolling this out. This is a time to be rethinking the way people move because we have no choice, but also rethinking what that movement needs to look like as we're moving in to many years after this. We don't know what is going to happen with coronavirus. We don't know if this will be the last pandemic. So if we can build communities and build transportation networks that allow people to move by different ways and allow people to have more space within their communities, giving them many more options to connect to transit and, as I always say, employment and education, it's going to make better communities. And it's not just a stopgap to give us more room so that we're not having to interact with each other as much. It really is an opportunity to allow humans to be central to the communities that they're living in. Because I think, unfortunately, prior to this, cars were central to the communities we were living in. And it's just a complete sea change. And it's amazing to see. But we have to keep it up. And we have to keep this focus on that as we're getting through this. I couldn't agree more. Uh, conversations that we're having now about opening up space for uh, other uses is would have been unimaginable a couple of months ago. And um, so I'm really, I live in Somerville, so shout out for Mayor Carter Tone, who's been amazing. And I know that I would, I could easily bike to work if I felt uh, safe biking to work. Um, and I, believe me, thought about that going forward um, until, you know, I feel like the tea feels safe to me. So um, I'm really happy to see that, um, you know, the mayor uh, 
Boston mayor has also been thinking about reconfiguring uh, space for, um, for the public to use. So um, I hope that we can keep that in place going forward. Um, have an interesting question here. Um, everyone's asking themselves these days how they can help. Uh, one question that's been um, submitted regarding the role for philanthropy. Um, what roles would it be most helpful for philanthropy to play to support this, transi this transition? I think we might have a couple of funders on the call. So um, how can they support the future of strong, safe, equitable, and sustainable public transportation? Um, what's your advice for funders on how to help? Wow, that is, that is not a particularly easy question. I would say really rethinking the places that you're putting those investments. I think that there were before and even more now, a lot of advocacy groups, a lot of planning advocacy groups, a lot of transportation advocacy groups, and then also more traditional planning firms that have really, really wanted to do this work for a very long time. And financially, a lot of the time, they just couldn't afford to do it. I would actually put a lot of the money into that because as you've seen over the last couple of years, a lot of these advocacy groups have actually put together really good plans and then brought them to those agencies and really pushed for them. And a number of them have actually been adopted. So I think it really is about putting money into the planning exercises to build the case studies, to build the pilot projects we need to prove a lot of these theories and to prove that our communities can be more equitable and can get better. I think the big thing though to really avoid is putting in funding for a study. It needs to be putting in money for a study that leads to a pilot that leads to the potential for implementation. The thing I hate as a planner is we spend money, we spend all this time creating these plans. Then we print them, we bind them, and then we toss them onto a shelf for nothing to ever happen with them. And so I just think there needs to be greater structure into that. So if you know, if funders can put together that structure, put out, you know, calls for proposals that lay out, here's a problem we're trying to solve. Here's how we think we can solve it. Here's what a pilot to do that would be. And here's what an implementation would be. And also here's the interdisciplinary team we're building to do this. Here are the partnerships that we have already put together to be able to pull this off. That is what I think we haven't had before. And I think that's what is going to be really, really helpful. We need to be asking specific questions of organizations that you're seeking to help. Don't just buy them supplies, but also provide them access to the expertise on how to use those supplies. Make sure that they have everything they need for a full safety system. Don't just buy masks if you haven't asked if they have a way to clean those masks, et cetera. Asking a lot of questions and helping organizations find the answers. And I think once again, traditionally, that is something that has just not been part of those projects, period. It needs to be much more laid out. There needs to be a significant amount of support from those entities in addition to the money they're providing. And I cannot hammer this home enough. It has to be interdisciplinary has to, has to, has to. And that implementation strategy needs to be there. And I'm not saying that that, you know, as they're working through that and building those pilots, that that's necessary the exact implementation plan they're going to be doing. But if they do not have an implementation plan strategy, they do not have a pilot strategy, and they do not have a clear idea of who those stakeholders need to be, we're going to continue to make a lot of really great plans, but we're not going to be building a lot of really good projects. Right. I mean, the whole point of a pilot is to learn from it and then mm -hmm. to figure out what worked and what didn't. So I think that's um, a great suggestion. Um, we talked a little bit about electrification, but I have another question. Um, zero emission and electric vehicles are another piece to the puzzle when we think about lowering our transportation emissions. Um, how do you see the transition to electric vehicles playing out post COVID? What methods do you think would best advance the state's goals while increasing equity and access to electric vehicles for larger portions of the population? Um, I know that we have um, a very ambitious goal, um, state goal to get to a certain percentage of uh, vehicles sold to be electric vehicles. We're nowhere near that goal. So I'm just wondering what kind of conversations you're having um, around electrification. 
not only of, of transit, but introduce introduction of and spread of electric vehicles. Well, I'll start with the transit portion. I think the electrification of our fleet is huge, huge, huge. It has been a question we've been talking about for a number of years, but now it's just we're reaching a point where the amount of pollution we're putting out as an industry is not making our communities any cleaner. We are one of the largest polluters. And so if, I think for us, we really are the ones that need to adopt it on a large scale. I'm not gonna talk as much about the electrification of the commuter rail, just because it is such a long-term project. There are so many open questions. So what I am gonna cover is talking about the electrification of our bus fleet. As I've said, it carries one third of our ridership. It is huge, huge, huge. And if we could electrify that, especially looking at the bus routes and what communities they're going through, we would have a huge impact on the greenhouse gases. Prior to the pandemic, we have been doing a pilot with um, a handful of electric buses. The biggest issue for us has been the facilities to maintain them. Our maintenance facilities have continued to be a massive, massive hurdle for us, not only in expanding the bus fleet, but expanding into different propulsion systems. That is actually the thing that we need the most to be able to transition to electric buses. We need somewhere to maintain them. We need to be able to build facilities within communities that are the nodes for the places that these buses need to come out of. Because the current facilities are older than a lot of the people that work at the T. And they just were never built for the number of buses that are going in them. They were not built for electric buses. And so from a development standpoint, from a land use standpoint, that needs to be happening now. It needs to be happening as soon as possible. If you can build those maintenance facilities, we can put the buses on the road. We can get the electric buses. Those battery systems are changing every month. They're getting better and better and better. So that is also just getting to a point where we can do the longer distance routes, which has been another really big hurdle for us and being able to shift to battery electric. I think moving forward, really going to a lot of the private sector around these electric vehicles, really pushing them to push their tenants, push their employees to adopt this, making this part of special permits for communities. Many companies, many developers, my company goes through it all the time. We go before city councils um, and we have to get them to give us a special permit to build this. And there are plenty of things that we already talk about. We talk about, you know, parking, we talk about bike facilities, we talk about, you know, shared use, we talk about carpool, van pool, shuttle system, all of these things. There have yet to be any very aggressive requirements and permits for electric vehicles. That is something that is very complicated. It's been very difficult nationally, but I think that is something that municipalities have to start looking at because unfortunately, a lot of the time you need to force people to do the right thing. And I think if you start building that into a lot of special permits, that is also putting a lot of pressure, as I said, on the public or the private sector, on those companies, on those developers, but also it starts to shift the thought process and the mentality for the residents and for the employees working there about what they need to be doing. And I think once again, greater subsidy. We need to help people, we need to subsidize these purchases because they are really, really expensive and it's already expensive enough to own a car. We need to find ways to offset that cost, especially for those who are having trouble affording cars as is. That I think that combination of factors is what it's gonna take I think to make that large shift into more electric vehicles. Great, well, I see that we've quickly gone through a whole hour, so I'm sorry we can't get to any more questions, but I just want to thank you again so much, Monica, for uh, sharing your thoughts on what's a very timely and relevant topic. Really appreciate you being with us today. Um, I also want to extend our thanks to Biogen, whose generous support makes this series possible. I'll keep an eye out for, um, for an email from the ALM team that will uh, have a link to a recording of this session. Also, you can register for next week's session as well with U.S. Congressman Jim McGovern, State Rep Tom Golden, and City Councilor Nina Liang. Um, I hope everybody stays well. Um, have a good rest of the afternoon, and thank you again for joining us. Good to see you, Monica. Good to see you. Take care. Take care.